Good morning, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Setu. I can recognize your voice. Yes, sir. Okay, very nice. Yeah, uh, I just... I'm trying to change the view a little bit here. That's good. And... Uh, Okay, it's fine. So let's begin. Um, there's a little bit more street traffic uh, because they have allowed traffic nowadays uh, in Bangalore. So you might uh, occasionally, um, occasionally you can hear uh, some auto rickshaws and uh, trucks and so on. All right, hopefully that makes it, uh, wakes you up a little bit uh, from my monotone maybe. All right, so um, yeah, do do jump in if you if I need to change something. For example, reminding me of changing the slides and things like that. I appreciate it because I have no way of knowing what you are seeing. Okay, so we begin a new topic today, which is actually chapter sixteen of deep learning, and it's a substantial chapter. Uh, the title of the chapter is uh, "Structured Probability Models for Deep Learning." So in a way, this is a different topic, but I think it's worthwhile uh, studying it while we're studying deep learning. The structured probability models are like uh, graphical models or probabilistic graphical models like Bayesian networks and Markov networks. They seem like a separate topic of its own where you want uh, to model complicated distributions involving variables of different kinds, and uh, they you would like to model them uh, reasonably and use them and use them to make predictions uh, called inference and so on that's a separate topic but it is very much a part of uh, deep learning because deep learning can act uh, as if there were those kinds of uh, graphical models after all in deep learning we have uh, we have nodes and uh, connectivities and that's exactly like a graph and so it seems like a nice match. So why do we need this kind of a framework is uh, because we want to go beyond uh, what uh, ordinary deep learning is about. Whenever you see a discussion of deep learning or any of the tutorials on deep learning, they usually begin with an example of classification, the uh, handwritten digit zero through nine to classify them or uh, the CIFAR 10 data set of 10 classes of natural images to classify them into 10 or the fashion MNIST into uh, 10 different uh, clothing types and so on. So there are classification problems and uh, we don't want to be left to the impression that that's what machine learning and deep learning are all about. Machine learning and deep learning can be used to do more complicated things than, than, than classification. Uh, they can be used uh, to learn probability distributions. That is, I give you a set of training samples. We actually are able to construct a model of how it is distributed. What does that mean? It means if I give you a new sample, it's going to be able to tell you what is the probability of this. Is this a mainstream common uh, element of your uh, training population or is it a far out one with a low probability? can give you that and it can also distinguish uh, uh, between uh, fine things coming from different parts of the distributions so uh, so you can do you can do learning of probability distribution that's the most important non classification type of problem with uh, with uh, deep learning and another thing you can do with these kinds of probability distributions is not an explicit probability distribution but an implicit one in that uh, you can generate samples that you have never seen before. So I give you a set of samples of, uh, let's say, uh, different uh, plants. And uh, it would have seen all these plants and then you ask it to give me a sample. And it could be some kind of a blend of these plants and gives you a, a, another plant which is not part of your original training data set. Or you have celebrity faces and it learns from the celebrity faces and gives you one more face that looks very authentic and very real, but 
it looks like a possible celebrity, but uh, there is no such celebrity exists. It kind of goes along with the probability distribution. So you can generate things, uh, and there are all kinds of applications for like generating speech, right? You can generate speech of a speaker who, who doesn't exist, uh, but learns from examples of people who speak. That way, you can create a create an Alexa or something which is uh, no real person's voice, but it's something that is synthesized like that. So many applications are there. Very interesting problem of uh, creating probability distributions. So how are we going to go about this uh, topic? There's a lot of things to study here. And my plan is uh, to maybe limit it to at most three lectures. I was hoping two lectures, but probably going to take me three, including today. So what are we going to study here is uh, we will begin with the basics, uh, the directed uh, probabilistic graphical models and then the undirected probabilistic graphical models. Directed ones uh, have causality, and we have talked about causality quite a bit, that uh, the hidden uh, units are causal features of the observed uh, data. So that exactly is the concept of a directed graphical model. And it has also got different names. It's referred to as, uh, uh, as not only a directed prob graphical model, but it's also referred to as a Bayesian net, Bayes net or a Bayesian network. The reason it's called Bayesian is not that there is some idea of a prior probability coming in, because usually when we think of Bayesian, we think of prior and posterior probabilities. The reason it's called as a Bayesian network is because uh, conditional probabilities come into play and Bayes rule comes into play. So we, we deal with joint probability distributions and conditional probability distributions and marginal probability distributions. So the Bayes rule is a useful rule to have. And a Bayesian network is not necessarily a causal model, but a causal model is represented conveniently by a Bayesian network. So it's kind of a directed graph. Say, so what causes what, right? So that is what is structured into the Bayesian network. So we'll find a certain class of uh, deep learning networks uh, thrive on that, particularly the things called uh, Boltzmann machines and restricted Boltzmann machines and so on are in that particular style of thinking of learning a probability distribution. Then we will also look at uh, probabilistic models that don't have directionality. There are a lot of situations we don't have causality, but there is a relationship between variables that they depend on each other. Like neighboring pixels of an image, uh, the values depend on each other because both of them belong to, let's say, a green grass or both of them belong to a, green, a blue sky and so on. So they may have undirected graphical models, uh, which uh, also have a different name in the probabilistic graphical models literature. We refer to them as Markov networks. So, or Markov random fields, because the reason all these names are there is these ideas have, uh, have been there for a long time. And so they, they were used under different names, but we are finding that they can all be unified together, particularly when we're coming into deep learning, saying we won't need, need each of them. And so convenient way of referring to them are BNs and MNs. BNs are uh, Bayesian networks, MNs are Markov networks. They're named after two, uh, famous uh, uh, mathematicians who made a contribution to statistics. Bayes, of course, to the Bayes rule, and Markov also uh, in, to the idea of uh, dependencies and so on, right? We've heard of uh, Markov dependencies and statistical uh, signal processing and so on. So anyway, we named them, we, uh, we have named them after Bayes and Markov, and one of them is directed, the other one is undirected. And so we'll introduce uh, simple models, simple example of a Bayesian network and a simple example of a Markov network, just to understand the concepts. For Bayesian network, the, the example we introduce is with three nodes. In all these graphs, we have nodes and edges or, or connections between nodes. Nodes are variables, random variables. Like we could have uh, three nodes in a Bayesian network one connected to the next and the uh, other one connected, to, connected to, the, the, to the previous one. So we have uh, three nodes uh, of A, B, C. A points to B, B points to C. 
So what does this network represent? We can think of uh, a simple example where, well, well, maybe A, B, C have some dependencies. One, for instance, uh, B depends on A and C depends on B. So uh, the simple example uh, our slides uh, illustrate is uh, that of uh, a relay race. Let's say we have a relay race where uh, A is the first runner. Uh, the names in the example that we have are called Alice, Bob, and Carol, A, B, C. So in this relay race, uh, Alice is the first one to run and hands off the baton to uh, B. And uh, B then runs and then hands off the baton to C. And C finishes, all right? So it's a relay race with three people, A, B, C. So in this case, the finishing time of C depends on the finishing time of B, right? And the finishing time of B depends on the finishing time of A. So there's a dependency between A and B and B and C, and it's a directed dependency. C depends on B, not the other way around. B depends on C. C depends on B. Similarly, B depends on A. And we can say the finishing times are T1, T2, T3 for the three runners. So we can say these finishing times, T1, T2, and T3, have a probabilistic dependency here uh, in, in, a, in a relay race. So we model that, we use a Bayesian network, and which says that there is a dependency between A and B and between B and C. <coughs> what about between A and C? And we argue that is not a direct dependency. So uh, C does depend on A. Okay, if A is a very slow runner, then the finishing time of C is also going to be low. But if we know uh, the uh, finishing time of uh, B, the in-between, we really don't need the dependency to A. So we say that there is a certain conditional independence going on here. That when we know B, uh, the finishing time of C does not depend on A. So it only depends on A. There is a certain advantage in making this observation that there is not a dependency between all A, B, and C together. Right? If each A, B, and C can take many values, then the number of possible uh, values, combinations of values, would be quite large. Even if, if, let's say, A, B, and C take 10 values each, then it would be uh, 10 times 10 times 10. It's a, thousand possible uh, combinations of values if each variable takes one of ten possible values. So we'd need a probability for every one of these thousand combinations. It's a pretty complicated looking table. For just three variables, each taking ten values, we need thousand probabilities. We'd say those are the thousand parameters of this distribution of A, B, and C. It's a discrete distribution. Each takes ten values. Is that how it's going to grow? If you're going to have three variables, you're going to have it at each taking 10 possible values, you're going to need 1,000 probability. So three is such a small number. We could have pixels of uh, hundreds of values or thousands of values or even millions of values. So it's completely infeasible to represent a joint probability distribution of variables using a tabular approach, saying what is the probability of this combination, that combination, and so on. For this, the Bayesian network comes in and says, well, there is a way around that is uh, don't represent things that don't have a direct rep uh, direct dependency. Just like in A, B, C, uh, C does not directly depend on A when you know B. Ah, that gives me a breakthrough and say, I can forget about uh, A when I'm modeling the distribution between B and C. So we say, if we know the conditional distribution between uh, C and B, that is independent of A. So we can have a conditional probability table between uh, B and C. B takes 100 values, C takes 100, uh, we took 10, right? We say take 10 values, 10 values for B, 10 values for C. That's a total of 100 possible combinations of values between B and C, and we need a probability for every one of these. The dependency between B and C can be specified by 10 times 10, 100 values. And similarly, the dependency between A and B, we can now ignore C, and say so that's 10 times 10, 100 values. So we, have, we, have, we now uh, need uh, 100 values for each of these. Uh, that's uh, 
100 probabilities. So we have 100 probabilities between, uh, between B and C and between C and B. We'd also need to know the uh, probabilities associated with A, which doesn't depend on anything. So we, let's say that also takes 10 possible values. So we need 10 probabilities for each value of A. So we can live with uh, 210 probabilities instead of 1,000 probabilities that we need when all dependencies are modeled. That's a very powerful scheme that says, if you want to represent a joint probability distribution of several variables, even a small number, let alone a large number, exhaustively looking at all probabilities for every combination is infeasible. And a Bayesian network tells you that uh, just looking at uh, the direct dependencies can cut down on the number of parameters you need for your distribution. And when the number of parameters is small, the number of samples you need to model the distribution is also small. For instance, if we wanted to model A, B, C all together, and we're saying we need 1,000 probabilities, 10 times 10 times 10, that's a 1,000, you need 1,000 probabilities. Then we ask the question, how many samples do you need to determine 1,000 probabilities? Say, well, some uh, order magnitude larger. You know, is, it, is 10 samples enough for, per probability? And uh, 10 may be too small. Maybe we need 100 samples uh, for every probability. You know, like how many samples do you need to calculate one probability? If you are, if you are, even if you argue 10 is enough, let's say for a coin toss, how many uh, tosses do you need before you figure out the probability of heads? You know? Okay, 10 is fine, I suppose. 100 would be even better. So if you need 1,000 probabilities and you need 10 for each, uh, you need 10,000 samples of uh, the relay race. So you'd have to run the relay race uh, 10,000 times, figure out what is happening to, uh, to Alice, uh, Bob, and Carol, get their finishing times, and you have to do this 10,000 times to calculate the probabilities properly. It seems like an impossible task. Whereas the other one, by breaking it down into pairs of uh, conditional probabilities, uh, is much more feasible. Still large, it's about 210, we said. Still large, but it's not as bad as thousand, right? So, so that is the idea of the Bayesian networks, and the Bayesian network uh, gets uh, deployed along the way in later models. So, I'm just verbally expressing all of this because these are all expressed in the slides. You can take a look at it. I'm just pointing it out to you. Uh, I think maybe it's easier to for me just talk about it with the conceptual nature of things and the uh, drawings and uh, slides and the PowerPoints uh, will fix these things, same arguments that I'm giving. So let me finish it uh, orally. Like the next one is uh, the idea of a Markov network where we have uh, variables that don't have uh, directionality but still have dependence. Right? Just like we had, uh, there is directionality between A, B, and C in the relay race example, supposing we have three people, A in this case, uh, uh, three people. One is you, you as the person, and one is your uh, roommate, right? And the other one is your colleague. Let's say you have one roommate, and then you have a colleague. And we have variables labeled HY, HR, and HC. HY is the node corresponding. We use H because you know this is like a hidden unit. So we have a H for you, HY, that represents you. And we have an HR that represents the roommate. And we have an HC that represents the colleague. We'll also assume that your colleague and your roommate don't know each other. They don't come in contact with each other. And we are talking now about a, some kind of a pandemic, that we have some kind of a disease, like a flu or a COVID going around. So you are in touch with your roommate and you are also in touch with your colleague. But your colleague and your roommate are not in touch with each other. How can we model this? So we can say, well, this is a, and there is a certain probability distribution 
about each person having the disease or not. Let's say each, way, each of these is a binary variable. As disease, not has disease. And there's a certain probability associated with each of these. So we are trying to model three variables, having disease, having not disease. And there is a combination of each of these. If there are only three variables, each is binary value, then there are only eight possible values, right? Zero, 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 one, all the way to one, one, one. There are eight possibilities of these three people. And every one of them has a certain probability that all three are free of disease or all three have the disease or some other combination and so on. So in essence, uh, we have a situation where there is a probability distribution about every combination. So as you can imagine, if it's only three variables, okay, and they're each binary, then we need a table of eight values. Supposing uh, each variable took on 10 values rather than two degrees of, uh, of whatever infection. Uh, then we need 10 times 10 times 10, that is uh, 1,000 values again. We need a table of 1,000 values to represent a probability distribution of three people for every combination of those values. So same situation as in the directed model. We are just now dealing with an undirected model. That is, uh, there is no directionality between you giving the uh, infection to your roommate or your roommate giving the section to you. Similarly, between you and your colleague, we are not keeping track of that. So it is just, uh, there is a dependency. If you have the disease, there is a good chance that your colleague has the disease and your, your roommate has the disease, right? So we have an in, a influence of the probabilities of these variables, but there is no directionality. This uh, non-directionality occurs in a lot of cases. I mentioned already pixels on an image. There is a dependency between pairs of pixels, but it is not like the right pixel influences the left or the left influences the right. It is just there is a dependency. So we can represent uh, situations like this by uh, a Markov network of, again, uh, three variables. And the graph here is, uh, again, um, there are only three uh, nodes, you, uh, your colleague, and your roommate. And uh, you have uh, uh, you have uh, uh, a uh, a dependency that you're representing by means of this Markov network. Now, how do you represent this probability distribution? Previous one in a Bayesian network, we said it can be represented by means of conditional probability distributions. In the Bayesian network, if I give you uh, p of a, p of b given a, p of c given b then the joint probability distribution of uh, that situation, the Bayesian network with the three relay runners is uh, factorized as P of A times P of uh, B given A times P of C given B. And that completely represents the probability distribution, <coughs> assuming that this, uh, this uh, uh, only direct dependencies. How can you do that with this Markov network? With a Markov network, we can't simply write uh, a, a factorization of this form. It's got to be a different form. And uh, in this different form, we use what are called as factors. And we write this as a factor associated with uh, the variables uh, A and B, and then between B and C, and we multiply those factors. And when you multiply these factors, we get what's called an, un an unnormalized distribution. So we look at what are the possible A can take, or uh, you know, the, uh, we, we use the uh, terms HY, HR, and HC. How many values can each of them take? And uh, a factor gives you some kind of an importance of, of how often that combination can occur. How often can be a situation where when you have the uh, uh, disease, your roommate also has the disease, it's probably high. Uh, how often when you have the disease, roommate does not have the disease, maybe small, or the other way around. When uh, you don't have the disease, your roommate has the disease. And the other one is uh, you both don't have the disease. Maybe that's a high probability. Similarly, between you and your colleague also. And we can have some weights associated with each of these combinations. And that defines, uh, when you take a product of these factors, you define what is called as an unnormalized distribution. And if you want to convert it into a normalized distribution, 
you have to divide it by a number called z or the partition function which is uh, a normalizing uh, term which sums over all the possible uh, products of these factors and so that uh, the assignment for any combination uh, becomes uh, a true probability so the probability has to lie between zero and one and all of the probabilities have to sum to one so if you have a thousand uh, possibilities all the probabilities should add up to one and uh, this way of modeling it is, is uh, referred to as a, uh, it has a certain name to this particular equation which involves a product of the factors divided by the partition function z. It's uh, referred to as a Gibbs distribution, as a name associated with it, named after uh, a well-known statistical physicist called Josiah Gibbs, right? Gibbs, uh, incidentally, was the first person to receive a PhD in engineering anywhere in the world. He received a PhD in engineering in 1900 at Harvard University. For his work on engineering and uh, what did he do he mostly did uh, statistics and probability for his uh, work and so we named this uh, markov distribution equation uh, as a gibbs distribution because these methods have existed for a long time gibbs is one of them gibbs formulation so we now have two mathematical ways of specifying a joint probability distribution either regarding the network as a joint uh, probability of directed uh, models or a joint probability of undirected models and referred to as Bayesian network Markov network. The uh, equation representing the probability distribution uh, is quite different. One uses uh, a simple product of conditional probabilities. The other one is takes uh, a product of factors and then normalizes it uh, so that uh, the result is a, is a true probability distribution. So we learn about, so today's lecture is really about uh, these models of uh, directed models and undirected models. And then what do we do? Well, we go on to a specialization further of um, the undirected models. Actually, the undirected model turns out to be more powerful from the point of view of Bayesian networks. Or, or deep learning, I should say, not Bayesian networks, uh, deep learning. Uh, deep learning does use the Bayesian network or directed models, particularly when we discuss things like uh, deep belief networks or Boltzmann machines, slightly older type style. But the more interesting uh, newer style is this uh, undirected models, because a Markov, you can think of, uh, think of a neural network as a bunch of nodes and edges connected between them. Together, it defines a probability distribution, doesn't it? Yes, your weights associated with all of them and these are like the factors and uh, I could uh, multiply all these factors out and uh, based on the connectivities you have given me and based on the weights you have given me. Uh, only thing is I need to divide it by a partition function which uh, looks at all possible combinations of values. And uh, you know, magically a neural network going from input to output is not only just a bunch of weights that are matrix multiplications to produce the output, they are also a way of representing a probability distribution of your data. Wow, isn't that remarkable? That uh, as you feed your uh, samples into your network, you're training it using back propagation, and you figured out all these weights, and then now we can come back and say, well, not only have we figured out how to produce an output, a function, because that's what our goal was, to produce a function uh, which uh, minimizes the loss function and all that. We learned all that. We are also saying, hey, this is something else. This is also learning a probability distribution. And, uh, and which means we can use that probability distribution to generate samples or to tell me what is the probability associated with any given sample. Of course, we need to structure the outputs properly for doing that, but it is possible to do that. So that's a remarkable thing. And then we move on to a particular uh, formulation of uh, uh, both directed and undirected graphical models, particularly the undirected models. We call, call it as the energy formulation. This area of modeling probability distribution with nodes and edges with Markov networks 
is all uh, based on statistical physics. They did all this long ago. It's like a bunch of explorers who went exploring the Wild West where nobody had an idea what, what's going to be coming up. And they said, oh, this is statistical in nature. We're going to model it like this. So statistical physics uh, gives you a rich uh, terminology and uh, methods. They were uh, 100 years ago or 120 years ago, 1900, around the time Osaya Gibbs was doing Gibbs distributions. There were people like Einstein and Dirac and people like that who were, um, uh, and then even uh, uh, thermodynamics uh, due to Boltzmann. They were all inventing these models and saying, okay, the atoms can be in uh, a positive spin or the negative spin and the energy of a gas is based on the uh, based uh, based on the directionality. If they are all uh, in the same direction, maybe energy is higher, energy is lower. So they use these words of potential. They use the word of energy uh, and equilibrium and entropy. And these are all terminology of physics, and we use the same words. So we talk about energy-based models for deep learning. And uh, in these energy-based models, we can think of a very simple energy-based model of a deep learning network. Let's say as a simple two-layer network, there is a visible layer V, which is the input layer, and there's a hidden layer H, which is uh, the hidden layer, there's only one hidden layer. So we are talking about an input layer, a hidden layer. So there is a V, vector V, and a vector H. So we have two vectors. Vs are connected to the Hs, all right? And uh, the Hs are not connected to themselves or Es are not connected to themselves. The simple network, uh, a general network of any kind of combinations of variables uh, is a Markov network, but in the terminology of uh, deep learning, we also refer to them as Boltzmann machines. Boltzmann machines uh, represent arbitrarily prob probability distributions. And uh, when we restrict the uh, Boltzmann machine to have an input layer and hidden layer, but there are no, no arbitrary connections. We only go from the input to the hidden. Such a network we refer to as a restricted Boltzmann machine or an RBM. Restricted in the sense the connectivity can only go from input to hidden. Right? There's in, not input to input or hidden. That seems like a fairly obvious thing from a neural network point of view. So, so a neural network is nothing but a restricted Boltzmann machine, RBM. And uh, we refer to the factors connecting the Vs and the Hs. We earlier on talked about how in such a model we need, uh, we need factors. And we are specifically saying those factors, we're going to refer to them as energy. There's a kind of connection between this. We have to transform the factors by taking negative logarithm of that to convert it to, into an energy model. So what we were uh, multiplying as factors, when you take uh, a logarithm of a product, it becomes addition of the logarithms. And we associate a negative uh, sign with it, uh, of this logarithm. Uh, in terms of minimization, maximization, etc., and uh, that becomes an energy-based model. So today, one of the topics in deep learning is uh, energy-based models uh, of neural networks, and that's all it is. So we can make a huge foray here by just learning about Bayesian networks, Markov networks, and go all the way to uh, uh, to Boltzmann machines and uh, restricted Boltzmann machine. So this is uh, largely the topic of this uh, set of slides. We just need to introduce the equations for them and so on. And uh, while I'm on this streak of just talking about it rather than going through the slides, uh, I mean, I, I can still quickly go through it, but you can also look through it on your own. The second set of slides is a little bit more about the properties of these networks about uh, how uh, one does inference with these networks, 
uh, and uh, we say when you are trying to infer a particular value through a network, that is for a given input, I would like you to tell me what is the probability of that, that's inference. Through the network, you got to run through with that input to figure it out. And that inference problem can be a, can be a complicated problem, it's an intractable problem actually. Intractable means the complexity is exponential, even with the Bayesian network. And so we have to think of uh, heuristics, <coughs> or actually some of them are exact tools, to, uh, to say, well, we don't really need to do every possible combinations. And we use uh, for Bayesian networks what are called as de-separation rules <coughs> or directed separation rules. And uh, where we can say, well, it's separated from the other node, so we don't need to consider it <coughs> like that. Similarly, we have uh, separation in Markov networks as well. So we have what are called as de-separation rules for Bayesian networks and Markov networks. So we get into some of the mechanics of these networks. Right, so that's uh, <coughs> the range of topics between uh, the two lectures, okay, today. So I'll see how much we can go through. Let's begin now by 16.1, uh, which is about structured probabilistic models for deep learning. <coughs> Hopefully you can see my slides. If not, please shout. So this is a structured probabilistic model for deep learning. Yeah, seeing the slide. Okay, you're seeing it? Okay, very good, very good, okay. So this Thank is a big topic. <coughs> so this is a big topic, which is actually the amount of material here in chapter 16 is, is the equivalent of a full course. There's that much of material here. Our goal here, because this is a course on deep learning, our goal is to learn the very basic essentials, enough to carry on, right? I mean, every subject is so rich and deep. So this is just a small piece. <laughs> deep learning is, uh, the reason I'm hiccuping is, somebody sent me a bunch of jokes just before this uh, class. And uh, I was just reading on WhatsApp, I was just reading all those and I got into a bout of uh, laughing and, and hiccups. And I was telling my person who sent me the jokes, oh no, I should not have read jokes just before class. So <laughs> here I am with a hiccup, uh, not because of my lecturing, but because of the jokes I saw earlier on. I should, I should share the jokes with you. Yeah. It's about the courtroom, courtroom uh, jokes, right? But the attorney asks a witness a question, and uh, the witness uh, is dumbfounded by the question and asks for a new lawyer. You know, anyways, funny jokes. All right, uh, hopefully that settled me down uh, from jokes to lectures. Okay, so we are into uh, this huge topic of structured probabilistic graphical models of PGMs for deep learning. And we begin uh, with an overview, which is about directed and undirected. Then we talk about challenge of unstructured modeling. What is a challenge is uh, in the real world, we encounter distributions that are not nicely organized. They're not just uh, pixels on a camera image, right? I mean, that's structured data, right? It's all uh, an array of pixels is our uh, two dimensional uh, world or the two on air on a, a camera of a cell phone. Also languages like that also is structured where you have uh, word after word after word after word. We can number all of them and say it's a sequence of words or a sequence of speech. So there's a certain structure to it. What if we have uh, an arbitrary set of variables? Some of them are discrete, some of them are continuous. Some of them, you know, like a doctor's type of uh, portfolio or we're looking at a chart there's some, there's an X-ray image here, which is uh, which is an image, all right. And there is also a speech recording maybe from the doctor, or there is also all these uh, uh, handwritten notes and uh, charts and whatnot, it's all kinds of things. Um, how do we model something like that with a probability distribution? 
So in a way, that's the challenge of unstructured modeling. Mm -hmm. Probabilistic graphical models allow you to do that. You can have uh, variables connected to each other. One is discrete, one is continuous. Oh, that's pretty powerful. And then we talk about the section two is about using graphs to describe model structure. My plan for today was the zero, one, and two. And uh, then we talk about sampling from graphical models. So if I construct a graphical model, just like uh, the three runners, right? Alice, uh, Bob, and Carol, the three runners, and we say, give me a sample. A sample means uh, some time at which uh, Alice finished and the time at which Bob finished and the time at which Carol finished, we might say, well, it's uh, three different uh, times we give and say that's how it was, that one sample. All together, they're defining a probability distribution of those three variables. Just like that, uh, the COVID example I gave of uh, you, your roommate, and your colleague. And give me an example of a situation uh, of one, one uh, scenario, and it will give you a sample that maybe all three have the disease. And of course, it will give you more samples that are more likely and, and uh, very few samples that are less likely. So those are called samples. But sampling from a graphical model. And then we'll talk about the advantages of structured modeling. These are mostly computational advantages, which is uh, if you used uh, a brute force tabular approach to a problem, it's impossible. Even a few variables will overwhelm you in terms of the number of combinations that are possible. And a graphical model is able to extract only the important relationships. And uh, how do we learn about these dependencies uh, from data? And then uh, in inference and approximate inference. Once the model is constructed, how do we inf do the inference? For this input, what is the uh, probability associated with it? Or for this sample that you want to generate, what is the complexity of generating a sample? And then if that is very complicated computationally, which uh, in all of these problems, computational complexity plays a constant role and uh, approximate inference becomes an issue. Uh, and then how does all this apply to deep learning? Our goal is not to become expert statistical modelers in uh, data analysis or something like that. We want to be specialists in machine learning and deep learning. Well, it applies directly to this one uh, machine I already mentioned today, which is called the Restricted Boltzmann Machine, or an RBM, which is uh, nothing but some uh, input uh, layer and hidden layer, and together they model the probability distribution, and uh, how does it model one, and how does it give you probabilities, and so on. So that is the overview of all of these topics. So running through these slides, uh, this one says deep learning researchers draw on many modeling formalisms to guide their design efforts and describe their algorithms. So when you look up deep learning papers, they'll say, here's a new idea I have got. And then how are they describing it? They'll throw in a bunch of equations and say that is the equation for uh, or the model I'm using. It, it could very well be in the form of a graphical model uh, it says here's, here's the Bayesian network representation for that. And uh, so this is the idea of structured probabilistic models. We're calling it structured because we're saying there's a, the graph has a structure to it. Which node connects to which node? So that is the structure. Although the goal is to model more complex unstructured world, we kind of put it in the form of a structured model. But it's much more flexible than imagining the world as a grid always, right? They're moving away from that idea. The world is a bunch of pixels. That is just one possibility. Right. So I give here in this slide two pictures in the middle of it. Uh, they are both stated in graph theoretic terms. The first one is a directed probabilistic graphical model in that there is an arrow between T0 and T1 and T2 we call it as directed, it's like an arrow going from one to the next. And the second one is an undirected probabilistic graphical model labeled HR, HY, and HC. You, your roommate, and your colleague. The first one you can think of it as a relay race. Alice hands off to Bob and Bob hands off to Carol. T1 
T0, T1, and T2 are the finishing times. So we're saying there is there's a probabilistic mechanism. If we ran ran the three of them many, many times, every time is not going to come out the same, right? Finishing time of uh, Alice is not always going to be exactly will finish at uh, you know 0.5 seconds or something. It's going to vary vary between 0.7 and 0.3 or something. So it's a probability distribution. And uh, there is a joint probability distribution about those three variables. And we may, want, we, may, we may want a sample from that distribution. We may have a training set that we are feeding these and you construct a model. And we'd like to get a sample. Or if I give you some combination of T0, T1, T2 values, so you would uh, tell me what is that probability based on all the data set that you've got. That's a directed PGM. The undirected PGM on the second one, second diagram, is HR, HYHC. There is no arrow here. It just says you and your roommate have influence on each other and you and your colleague have an influence of each other. And the three of you jointly represent a probability distribution of the states the three of you can be. Disease, no disease. And uh, again, you'll have to take lots of examples of the three values and construct the particular influences and we're going to model it not by an exhaustive table of all three values, because I've already talked about it. Thousand, thousand, thousand means you'd need a, or hundred, 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 we'd need a thousand value table. It'd be huge. We want to model it by just looking at the relationship between pairs of variables here. We refer to them as a click. In this undirected graphical model, we say HR and HY are a click. C L I Q U E. A click means that they are together. And the HY and HC are a click. The reason we use the word click is uh, you know, the graphical model may involve many more variables. And if uh, all the variables connected to each other are referred to as clicks, they're influencing each other. So if A influences B, B influences C, and C influences A, we say A, B, C are a click. Like that. So we, we represent the factors uh, corresponding to the clicks. So what do these models offer to deep learning? And so we say, and the graphical models community, as I said, it's a whole course. And uh, in, in a course on probabilistic graphical models, we discuss these kinds of models. We discuss how to train these models from data. And after you have trained them, how do you do inference with them? That is calculate any, uh, for an input, you want to find the output or you can use the model to determine a particular uh, joint probability of a certain set of variables or conditional probabilities of certain variables or even marginal probability of certain variables. You can infer any of these things from a model and those are called inference algorithms and almost all of them are intractable. The number of combinations of values of these variables can be high. For example, 100 possible values for each variable. In which case, the number, of the inference task of uh, evaluating what is the most like the maximum likelihood estimate of a certain probability involves running through all possible combinations and that becomes exponential. And so those are intractable problems. So we have to deal with approximate inference algorithms. So that, that is a whole field. The first, dot, first uh, bullet point here, graphical models community has developed is an entire field. But some of these are very useful for deep learning. And we will highlight uh, which of these models have proven most useful. So deep learning differs from general probabilistic models in terms of the model structures. So we are going to be interested in specific model structures. They're not arbitrary graphs. These are coming out of our networks. This is a feed forward networks that do layer by layer by layer. So the model structures are very specific. And how to figure out the weights in this model, the factors, if you will, uh, we use this idea of back propagation from one to the next, and it might be quite different from what is used in general graphs. There again, we'd be using some kind of optimization for general graphs. Here, our graphs have a peculiar nature that they are, they are layer by layer. So the learning algorithms are going to be specific. 
Uh, so also the inference procedures are not going to be general graph inference, but uh, you know, feed forward graph inference. So we encountered all of this in this study. So as I said, this is a big chapter. And uh, in this chapter, we discuss challenges of large scale probabilistic models and uh, uh, graphs to describe. And so what are the best graphs to describe probability distributions? <coughs> we need to figure out which variables need to interact directly and uh, discuss uh, approaches to overcome difficulty uh, and uh, by learning about these uh, dependencies. So we look at these computational issues and the unique emphasis in deep learning approaches. So PGM is a broad study. PGM for deep learning is a very specific study. So the challenge of unstructured modeling. So what is this? Uh, what do we mean by unstructured modeling? It says deep learning is to scale machine learning to the kind of challenges needed to solve AI. So when we uh, say that we're trying to solve artificial intelligence problems and we're gonna use it by solving machine learning approach, using machine learning approaches. So which means uh, we are trying to solve very general problems, not just one about images off of a camera. This means being able to understand high dimensional data with rich structure. So it could even be understanding natural images. So even if it is the camera, the images may be uh, with an ordinary environment. It's not a specific background. It's not like you only have a blue background or a green background. In Zoom, you can do that, right? You can put whatever background you want on Zoom. Uh, so here we're talking about natural environment uh, as opposed to a synthetically rendered image or a screenshot of a web page. Uh, there could be audio waveforms representing speech, natural speech with uh, auto rickshaws and lorries and all that as you can hear in the background. Uh, documents with multiple words, punctuation characters, and so on. So these are all complicated things that we, we might have input. So the classification task of machine learning is a limited goal. Simply saying this is a dog or a cat is a very limited goal. So in classification, the input uh, from a distribution is summarized with a label. We might have a distribution of all cats and all dogs, and we need to summarize it saying, well, that is the cat, it's an object in a photo, or it's a word in an audio. While I'm speaking, you're identifying the word, or you're identifying that this is the topic of this uh, slides are machine learning, topic of the document and discards most of the input and ignores background when recognizing objects. So in classification, we're only interested in saying the cat or dog and uh, whether it's got some plants or trees in the background is irrelevant. And it produces a single output or a distribution or values that, of that single output. It could be a distribution over 10 classes and we're giving a probability of each of the 10 classes. Whereas a true probabilistic model can do many other tasks, often more expensive than classification. And what are these things? We I already alluded to this all here. So produce many output values, not just one value, but a range of output values. Um, such as outputting as a, an example, right? a sample image. It's not like uh, I'm outputting uh, whether it's a you know dog or a cat. You're saying here is a new image for you a whole bunch of values. And understand the uh, entire input with no ignoring of sections. It, you know, what if we were to say dog in a, in a, on a street or something? So some of these tasks are uh, density estimation. So the first one is probability density. That is taking all the samples and figuring out what are all the modes in this distribution and uh, you know where do they occur and that kind of thing. So that you can use that to associate a probability with an input. Denoising, I give you a, an old photograph taken in the 1920s, a black and white image, and you're able to convert it into a sharp black and white image. 
denoising problem. Input is an image, output is an image. So it's a multi-valued output, it's not just a class. Third one here is the missing value imputation. That is, uh, I have a chart here, but I don't have one value. And uh, how do I guess that value? And that guessing cannot be just based on the distribution of that value alone, but it has to take into account all the neighboring values uh, and uh, make an intelligent guess. So if you have a medical chart that somebody forgot to measure, uh, say, uh, blood pressure, and you've got all the other details available. So the guess cannot be based on simply saying, put the normal there. You, you have to want to guess it based on all the other factors. So that is an intelligent task of uh, imputing a value. Sampling is uh, to generate samples from the distribution. New samples could be entire images or values. So the density estimate, okay, there are four slides here corresponding to the four tasks. The density estimation task is given an X. I give you a new one, new value as input. Return P of X under generating distribution. So you have been trained and I'm giving you a new value and you got to tell me what's the problem. Although one output, we need an entire input space. I can't simply say, well, it's input to output. I can't say the training is uh, mapping from that X to this particular value. You would have to have an understanding of the entire distribution and normalize it. If the element, uh, if even one element of X is unusual, it has to be assigned a low probability. And uh, another important uh, to topic that has emerged in deep learning is we say that the modes of the distribution must be preserved. Here's an example of a distribution with four modes. There are four hills here, four peaks. And it says if that is the nature of the data, you should be preserving the four modes and not simply think of it as one mode, one peak uh, by an average of all of that. And uh, if you merge them all together, that is referred to as a mode collapse. A particular uh, generative model called a generative adversarial network, GAN, has a famous problem with this called mode collapse problem. And this picture here is illustrating the idea of what happens when uh, modes collapse. So this is a generative model. We have modeled, we have, we have given inputs of celebrities or something, faces, and uh, it has modeled all of them. It has learned how the distribution of the pixels, this is about a million pixels each, that to RGB color images, it's figured them out. Figured out the entire distribution. And then we're saying, give me a sample. And it is generating these samples. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight samples. So this one apparently has some mode collapse going on. So for instance, images with the same underlined color look similar. This red image here and this red image, they look similar, these two. And, uh, and then for example, this blue and this blue, this and this blue are about roughly the same person and this green and this green are about the same person. So what is happening is we are asking for samples of people and it's again and again going to the same person and generating that quite often. It's just one or two. So what is basically happening is this distribution with, uh, with uh, many people would have had to have many modes and uh, it is generating samples corresponding to the same peaks and not distinguishing between all of them. So, so density estimation task is a sophisticated task. To figure out the probability distribution from the point of view of generating samples from that distribution. So I already mentioned the denoising task. Uh, we, here we have uh, an input X tilde, which is a noisy image. We have to generate an X out of it. So the system is asked to remove dust or scratches from the old photograph, and generate a good image. This requires multiple outputs and every element of the Kleenex. So we want every one of them to be generated. Right? So that is a denoising task, which has to take into account neighboring elements, the context and all that. 
So this is again a deep learning task. Missing value imputation, I already mentioned it. We have this red value that is missing and we want to impute the value based on all the green values the surrounding above, below, on the side and all that. And uh, maybe these are pixels, maybe these are other kinds of neighborhoods. So we need to do that. And uh, the sampling task, uh, again, is uh, sometimes a generative model may be able to generate a probability associated with their input. But certain generative models cannot do that, but they can generate samples for you. So a true generative model would be one that not only gives you probability associated with input, but can also be used in a sampling manner. It's just give me samples from your distribution uh, so that the samples reflect how often uh, they occur in your model. And uh, this is again, again, a generative adversarial network, which actually takes as input uh, a value from a normal distribution, zero one, it's called the standard normal distribution. Or it take, requires, it takes a sample from a minus one to plus one uniform distribution. And uh, takes these as input. And uh, from that it generates a value G of Z, this is the, uh, this is the normalized version and we are getting a, an H value out of that and we use that H value to generate an actual sample from that. So this says this value is 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, minus 0 0.6, so this is taken from N01 distribution. That sample from that N01 distribution whose dimensionality is, is correct, uh, maps directly into this cup here because it's been trained on cups. Similarly, a value from an unnormal, from a normal, normalized uniform distribution between minus one and plus one generates another kind of cup over here. Isn't that cute? That you, you can generate different kinds of cups. All you're doing is starting out with a standard normal distribution or a standard uniform distribution. And with each sample corresponds to a different, different object from the distribution you have learned. So this is a sampling task. You can, this is called the problem of image synthesis, <clears throat> generating images. Or it can be used uh, for speech synthesis where we produce waveforms like natural human speech. Uh, and uh, they should be generated from the correct distribution and not from even uh, one sample cannot be from the wrong distribution. This is uh, one more example from a sampling task with uh, natural images. Here we have the CFAR10 data set, which is only 10 classes, and they are natural images like ship, cat, truck, frog, automobile, and bird, horse, right? That's all, the 10 classes. These are all samples in this data set. There are 60,000 such color images in CFAR10, and their spatial resolution is 32 by 32, and uh, it's uh, in, RGB, three, three colors, and each of them RGB is zero to 255 brightness. And that is how these uh, images are defined. So here are a few enlarged images. I guess there's a bit blurry. There's a cat here and there's a horse here maybe, and so on. There's a, there's a car here. These are all uh, samples in the data set. And here they've generated samples after learning from this data set, you are generating your own samples. And uh, these are being uh, placed right next to these ones here, the nearest ones. So, well, here's a different version of that image. Here is a different version of the horse, different version of the horse or different version of the car and so on. So the model is truly synthesizing new images rather than memorize them, right? Okay, so the topic after this is about uh, intractability and the efficiency. I guess I can just finish these four slides uh, so that we can start a fresh one. I only have about four or five slides left. So this says that uh, rich distribution, what do you mean by rich? Even the CFAR 10, 32 by 32 by three, 
if I say how many possible values are there in a 32 by 32 image with three colors RGB, and what if we, in RGB, we are not using zero to 255, we simply say it's black or white, zero or, zero or one. It's very poorly thresholded image. So there are only 32 by 32 by three, each can only be zero or one binary. Then we ask the question, how many possible images are there? It says, well, 32 by 32 by three is uh, 3072. And each of them can take, each bit can take on one of two values. So that's two to the power of 3072 possible images. So I can, I can define two to the power of 3072. What does that mean? It means this is roughly 10 to the 800. So with 32 by 32 by three, I can define 10 to the power of 800 different images. And what is 10 to the power of 800? That is larger than the number of atoms in the universe. Oh, wow. It includes the Milky Way and, you know, galaxy C31 in the Andromeda constellation, <laughs> which is in, going to collapse into the Milky Way. So if you look at all the atoms, it's more than that. Wow. So it says a probability distribution over 32 by 32 by three, where you have a probability for every combination of values is uh, hopeless. You just cannot even make a table that big. Right? That quickly we reach, uh, we reach intractability. More generally, if X has N discrete variables with K possible values, representing P of X by a lookup table requires K to the power of N parameters, right? So why is it infeasible? Because of memory, because of statistical efficiency, because of runtime inference, because of runtime sampling. So a lookup table is only this. Supposing your variable input X, I uh, had four values, X0, X1, X2, X3, and these four add up to one, four probably. That's a lookup table. That's only one variable with four possible values. If the number of possible values is two to the power of three, 30, 72, this table will be that long. So the you can't even have that much memory. Um, and then statistical efficiency, as the number of parameters increases, so does training data needed to choose values. If you're gonna have a table that big, you need data set many times that to evaluate the probability of that combination occurring. And the runtime cost of inference, if you want to use uh, such a joint probability distribution to infer a conditional probability, you'll have to sum out the other variables in the joint probability and uh, that summation it's, uh, itself, the number of terms in that summation is exponential. So you can't run inference. And supposing I needed to give you a sample from that model, uh, by uh, dividing a space into the possible values and using a uh, standard uh, sample from U01, uniform zero to one and figure out where it falls. And that again, the number of possible uh, subdivisions of that line is again, is impossible. So the full table approach is overkill. And uh, we say, okay, it's not possible. Why is it not possible? Because it's, you're trying to model every possible interaction between variables. Saying how often does this combination occur? How often does that combination occur? And probability distribution, the real tasks are much simpler than this. So we've already talked about uh, manifolds and so on. So every combination is not going to occur. And uh, usually variables influence each other only indirectly because of the laws of physics and so on. So uh, this is again the Alice, Bob and Carol example of the three, uh, the relay race between Alice to Bob, Bob to Carol. And uh, this is saying instead of modeling all three variables in all their relationships, we omit the third interaction between Alice and Carol. If we know Bob, we don't need Alice. So in a way, that's, that's the idea of de-separation. We say that Bob insulates Carol from Alice. If you know Bob's finishing time, you don't need Alice. So that is called de-separation idea. So probabilistic graphical models, uh, 
model direct interactions. Uh, so and therefore have fewer parameters and in terms of storing the model and doing inference on the model. Okay. All right, I'll stop there. So I've given you an overview of what are probabilistic graphical models and how they could be useful for us. And then we get a little bit deeper into how this model is useful with deep learning. Okay, so uh, if anyone has a question, I can take that. All right. Okay, fine. So uh, we meet again. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, Himanshu, tell me. Ask me. Sir, as uh, we have received a mail that the semester will be completed online. So uh, how are you going to complete the final exam and the, uh, the rest of the uh, this semester? Yeah, there are only uh, two remaining projects, right? Uh, and uh, originally we had deadlines uh, much earlier and we changed it to April 15th. And uh, I think at that time we said, okay, try and finish it in one month, which is May 15th. So here is what I, I'm saying, you know, the problem is there are so many uh, projects being graded and, this, and the TAs who are also doing this, uh, you know, in a volunteering way, uh, need some time to look over rather than rush it in the last minute. So if you have finished it and you want, so those who submitted by April 15th got some feedback saying, okay, well, everybody else is getting till May 15th because you did it ahead of time, we'll give you some feedback to improve it. Same thing again here, if you have done with it, and many of you might have strictly followed it and done it, so please hand it in so we can also look it over. If you have good reason to say, look, I, I have I've got a very poor internet connection, I'm in this small village and all this, that's a reasonable uh, excuse uh, with this COVID situation. So we'll take that into account and we'll give you, uh, we'll take it into account a little later. So. I'm hoping that most of you will be able to finish by this week. And if you can't, we are uh, going to give you another chance. Because you already got a one month from last month. And that was itself, uh, I think, a few weeks. So that's what we'll do. So you're not going to be penalized if you are uh, not able to finish because of your circumstance. Okay. So anyway, do it if you can. All right. And spare some trouble for our TAs to not be rushed at one time. Okay, because the class is quite large. Okay, any other uh, technical question? Uh, with the deadline for the project four be extended. What's that? Deadline for the project four. Be yeah, those are the uh, those are the ones. You know, originally the semester was supposed to be over, right? I think we had originally got uh, the earlier ones. So let's see. You know, I think IAC is supposed to reopen uh, first week of June. So if there is further delay, we'll have even more time. Okay, so I think it's better to know that there's a deadline now and you try and finish it. And uh, if you want to finish it in another 15 days, okay, fine, let us know about it, all right? So anyway, those of you who are working hard and finishing it up and do have access, please do so, all right? So I'm not gonna fix the date because even IIC has not fixed the date. I don't know what's gonna happen. Is it sir, hard? Uh, actually, uh, sir, actually we have received a mail from the Dean of Engineering. That yeah. this semester has to be completed online. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, uh, it has to be completed online. I think they, what they did was the end of June is the is the final yeah. date, right? End of June, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we we'll aim for that too. We'll uh, we'll see. We'll be flexible about it. So uh, we are just trying to see when we have some extra time now. Uh, let us finish it off. So you can move on to other things. You know, you, you want to do other things on your internship or whatever you're doing. So try and uh, wrap up one thing so you can go on to the next thing, okay? All right. Okay, so I'm gonna terminate the class now and uh, we will again gather and you can send me email more or Piazza or something, okay? All right. So.